Hi everyone. Hello and welcome to the live stream. You are watching the Piedmont Trails channel and my name is Carol and I hope everyone has had a happy and wonderful, wonderful, fantastic Thanksgiving weekend uh, celebrating with friends and family. Uh, it just doesn't get much better than that, does it? Uh, except for maybe the journey to the past. <laughs> but I hope everyone has had a fantastic Thanksgiving weekend. Um, we've got Jay Webb on here. Hi, I'm in Mississippi, but my father was from Rutherfordton, North Carolina. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight's uh, topic is going to be all about the Great Wagon Road during a specific time period, and that is going to be the 1730 decade. Um, I get uh, this questions all the time. Well, Carol, did the salvage, uh, did the Great Wagon Road even exist during the um, 1730 decade? And yes, absolutely it did. And tonight we are going to discuss that and talk about it and talk about the people who traveled the road uh, where the where the actual road existed during that time period, what kind of shape it was the road was in, and we're going to talk about the true definition of a road during this specific time period in between 1730 and 1740. Elaine Thompson is here. Hi, she's from Alabama, researching the McCory surname. Yay! Well, welcome. Thank you for joining me this evening, Elaine. Thank you. Be sure to say hi to me, you guys. Let me know that you're here. Um, if you feel free to let me know where you're from and share with me what you're working on. Um, and chat amongst yourselves, too. And you can find new friends here. And uh, we just all enjoy the journey to the past together. Scotty is here. Mine lived in south of New Market, Virginia, along the road. Excellent. That is great, Scotty. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's great. Um, all right. I'm not going to waste any more time. We've got a lot of material to cover. So I have listed sources on the description already. Um, don't remember how many it was, but they are all part of tonight's presentation. Uh, I've included the, um, they're mainly books and I've got them stacked up behind me here of what I've used for tonight's presentation. I will also be naming maps uh, throughout tonight's show too. And you can view all of these maps online and it will show you, they primarily date from this time period of what we're going to be talking about tonight so that you can actually see on the maps by these surveyors where the road actually was during that time period. So it's exciting. It's exciting to, um, go back and research and see all of this information that had come to life. And we can kind of be, put our shoes in our ancestors' shoes and kind of somewhat experience what they did uh, as they traveled. But we're going to get started. So the Great Wagon Road was known by, as I'm sure many of you have known, by different names. It was known by the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road. Um, it was known as the Great Road. It was known as the Great Warrior's Path. Um, it was known as the, parts of it was known as the Con uh, Conestoga Road. Um, other names was Carolina Road or the Great Valley Road. These, all of these names are associated with this Great Wagon Road. Um it's amazing of the history of this. It did originate as a Native Ameri American trail. Um, like many of our early colonial roads did, they, uh, there were a great many of them who originated this way. But the Great Wagon Road, it was known by all kinds of names. Um, the truth is that roads were actually not named during this time period like they are today. Um, today, now you have to name a road. Uh, it has to have a certain road. It has to end in a certain pre, uh, de, uh, like street or road or trail. Um, but back then it was nothing like that. They were only known by names to the local people who lived near them. Otherwise, they weren't known by names. A road in the 1730 decade is defined as a route that was suitable for wheeled wagons and carts. So in other words, oh, Melissa's here from Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, Melissa. Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you had a great uh, Thanksgiving weekend and enjoying yourself so far. Um, the 
Roads, I'm going to define roads. Back in the colonial period, people didn't call a road a road unless it was suitable and wide enough for a wheeled wagon or a wheeled cart. Otherwise, it was called a path, very popular, called a trail, or it was called simply a route. Um, it wasn't called a road. A road ha had to be meet specific standards in colonial language and colonial vocabulary. So a footpath, uh, that, that pertains to just a regular path. This would have been um, trails that would have been only done by horseback or by walking. OK, so the Great Wagon Road started out as a footpath. We all know this. What we all strive to do, especially with the project, is we try to strive where it originally was located. Um, over time, it became a major migration road where it could accommodate not just one or two wagons, but in some cases, the wagons could be three in a line in the width. It would be that wide because of so much traffic going down this road. This was the first major highway. I love telling that to everybody because I, when I do, I see their eyes just pop up like, what? <laughs> was it really that wide? Yes. As time grew by, it became where wagons just could easily pass one another, uh, going one way and the other way. And then one could be pulled over on the side of the road and have plenty of room. Herds of cattle. This was a major transportation road to market uh, for herds of cattle and um, swine, hogs, pigs, um, sheep. They were get going up and down the road as well. So over time, yes, it was very wide in some places. But that's the definition of a road during that time period. Like many early of the early colonial roads, the Great Wagon Road originated as a long distance trail. It was a long distance trail that connected Pen Lancaster, Pennsylvania, all the way to Augusta, Georgia. Prior to families using this route, the coastal road known as the King's Highway was the only road that traveled throughout the colonies. I'll repeat that. The King's Highway was a coastal road that was, pretty, for the most part, maintained, um, that traveled all throughout the colonies on the eastern seashore. It was the only road that did that through all of the colonies until the Great Wagon Road appeared. And then when the Great Wagon Road appeared, then you had, uh, it traveled nearly 800 miles from Pennsylvania to Georgia. And it was an inland road. In other words, it was away from the coastal uh, seashore. So it was the first inland highway. Um I've given history of this road in other videos and articles, so I'm not going to go too much more on the history part of the road because I want to concentrate tonight on the 1730 decade, and I want to share what the Great Wagon Road Project has discovered regarding the original route. Now, I will look up periodically and see what you're typing. Uh, Bessie is here. Hello from Jonesville, Louisiana. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I will look up and see your comments and I'll try to answer the questions the best that I can. I don't pretend to be an expert on any of this. I'm just sharing with you what we've discovered from the Great Wagon Road Project and what I've history and knowledge I've accumulated throughout the years. If you are tracing your family from Pennsylvania and they resided near Lancaster or Columbia, Pennsylvania, or they were living near the Susquehanna River, they would have traveled the road that connected Philadelphia and Lancaster. They would have known about it and they would have traveled it. To make this more understandable, um, colonial families living in present day counties in Pennsylvania, such as Berks County, Lehigh, Northampton, Bucks, Montgomery, Chester, Delaware, Lebanon, Lancaster, Perry, Cumberland, York, Adams, Skullkill would have used the Lancaster Road to reach Maryland. So if they were traveling in that direction, they would have used the Lancaster Road. The, and another name for this is the Conestoga Road. Okay. This route was a clear defined road in 1727. 1727. There's Brian Sherrill is here. My ancestors were frontier folks. That's the Wagon Road people. Yes, the Wagon Road people. I, I like that. And I, um, I think
think I mentioned that it was also known as Con the Conestoga Road. Yes, and it was the main inland route into Philadelphia. So if you wanted to head into Philadelphia for various market um, reasons um, or for trade or for court purposes, or that was the main road to use to, to head into Philadelphia. Very few taverns existed along the route until halfway through the decade. By then, the Buck Inn, operated by Griffith Evans, um, the original building survived until 1964, and I found pictures of the original building online yesterday um, that were taken right before it was demolished. And um, it was built, I think, around 1734, 1735. I could not find any records here in the attic for um, the original date of the Buck Inn. But from everything from what I could gather, if you happen to know that, I would love to know when it uh, was first constructed and when it first went into business. But it was a popular stop along the route. Milestones did not appear on the road until around 1740. And that's important to note. Um, for the milestones, they were created to show how much distance it would have taken from that particular spot to Philadelphia. And there are many that were saved that I think they're housed in many of the historical societies in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, the Three Tons Tavern, that's Three Tons, it's T-U-N-S, Tavern, were, was also up and running by 1730. It was operated by Richard Hughes. And then other places of interest are the Pine Ford, which was one of the favor, uh, famous crossings, and the Harris Ferry. Now, Wright's Ferry, which is known as Columbia today, was a thriving Quaker community during the 1730s. And families who lived in this area surrounding the Lancaster Road used side routes from smaller settlements to uh, join the main road. By the way, this was the most common name for the Great Wagon Road during the 1730s was that main road. You take that main road, or they called it that Great Road. Take the Great Road. Others would also use Conestoga Trail, and we find this name prevalent as we cross over into Maryland. It crosses the Monocacy River in present-day Frederick, and it moves forward to South Mountain and the Hickory Tavern and reaches the Potomac River at Pack Horse Ford. Edmund Cartledge owned the property known as Hickory Tavern, Tavern, and the Great Wagon Road is today the main street in Sharpsburg, Maryland. Okay. It would be another 25 years before Braddock would use his this road, portions of this road, to create a military route during the French and Indian War. So we're we're in we're still in 1730. Okay. This was a road into Maryland, and it reached the Pack Course Ford. It was a road. There are four main roads in Maryland during the colonial period, and I go into detail about the four main roads on a recent podcast that I published back during the summer. Um, you can visit PiedmontTrails.com to learn more about the other routes that were available during this time period in Maryland. Um, two of those routes that what became four major roads in Maryland were in 1730. I'm just footpaths. You could not travel down it with a wagon or a cart. Um, there was only two roads that were available in Maryland, and one of them was the Great Wagon Road. Ron says in the 1730s, we were still in Pennsylvania and Maryland. That road you mentioned had to have been the one they traveled. Yes, yes. If they traveled from Maryland into um, Virginia, then they crossed uh, the Potomac, and they traveled in the 1730 decade. They crossed the Potomac at the Pack Horse Ford, and they used the Great Wagon Road to get there. No doubt about it. Before we enter to, into Virginia, one of the most, mis, most misconceptions when researching this time period, and I hear this all the time, and I just heard this the other day, is the word uninhabited. Um. All of the areas mentioned tonight do not meet this uh, characteristic. The native tribes created the trail and the early land records 
dating back to this period clearly point out the growth of settlements and the defined roads to each of them. All early land records have one thing in common, and that is that families settled near the road that brought them to the area. You wouldn't have a family travel to an uninhabited area. <laughs> now, don't misunderstand. All these areas were previously inhabited. They all had trails that led to them. And then these trails later grew into roads. And the previous people, the native tribes, they moved away. Um, in the Virginia area, they moved away for the most part in the western sections where the Great Wagon Road was down through the Shenandoah Valley on their own. And this was the result of the Lancaster Treaty uh, dated in 1744 where the Iroquois nation came to, into an agreement and offered peace um, with the families and settlers, and this took place in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, at the courthouse. Now, everyone participated in that, including the Cherokee, except for the Catawba tribe. The Catawba tribe did not show up, which they were not part of the Iroquois nation anyway, but they were trying to develop a peace um, so that they could use this road and start allowing families to live along the road. There were already families living along this road or trail. In some places, it was still a footpath. And in the Shen uh, upper Shenandoah Valley, it already became a road um, before 1744, before the treaty was ever signed. So to say that an area was uninhabited um, is rare. And it would be very rare to find an area that was not inhabited by someone else. And there had to have been something to have led these families to it. And in this case, it was the Great Warrior's Path, that, that major trail that they used back and forth. And the Catawba used it back and forth to attack the um, native tribes in Pennsylvania. And then they would, in turn, travel back down through it and to attack the Catawba or, or ok Okaneechi tribes. They were constantly into it, so... It took roads to lead them there, and they settled along the roads. Um, lost my place. I'm sorry. Hoist Height. That's where I wanted to go. Hoist Height and 16 other families traveled by wagon in 1731. They traveled by wagon in 1731. They crossed the Potomac River at Pack Course Ford. So what does this tell us? This says, this tells me, they traveled through Pennsylvania on a road that was wide enough and clear enough for them to travel by wagon. Then they traveled into Maryland on a road and they reached the Potomac River on the same road and crossed it. Now, what happened once they got uh, across on the other side is a different story. <laughs> The only people who settled away from the road were trappers, hunters, uh, mountain men. These were the type of people who did not want to be on the road. The reason being is they are active with the fur trade that is just exploding right now um, during this decade. It's coming down to uh, an end of it. But right now in the 1730 decade, it's still going strong. So the only people that would be living out off or away from the road are the hunters, the trappers, the mountain men, the tradesmen um, who are dealing specifically with the fur trade. And you may have ancestors who did that very thing. If you research further into the surveys made by Robert Brooke, last name B-R-O-O-K-E, he's very important in this time period, Robert Brooke. You will quickly realize where the original road traveled during the 1730s in Virginia. Prime examples of these are the surveys for John Littler, L-I-T-T-L-E-R, Abraham Hollingsworth, and Christopher Wendell. All of these surveys date from 1734, and they specifically state the road, the Great Wagon Road. By 1735, over 200 families are living in the Shenandoah Valley, and the Great Wagon Road is the only route to market for trade. It was not until 1746 when a road was established to reach the Alexandria port, but then we also have another road that comes from the James River, and these roads were able to offer trade and um, 
for the families to market their items um, during the latter part of the 1730 decade. But to reach the Alexandria port, that road wasn't established until 1746. And many Lincoln roads joining the Alexandria road since it ended at Winchester. The main reason for this road, later known as the Pioneer Road, was used for trade. And that's what these roads were for. Same thing with the three-notched road, which I'll get into later, um, that traveled down to Richmond. These were for trade purposes for these early families living in the Shenandoah Valley. A good example, if you want to research into um, what the economy was kind of like, flower prices during the 1740s, they just skyrocketed. Um and it was a great time for the colonial families to benefit from these soaring prices overseas. It's not that the prices were um, skyrocketing here in the colonies, but they were able to benefit from trading, international trading with the West Indian, England, and other countries. And um, they had to get this to port in order to benefit that. And that's why these roads became very important. Let me see what Melissa says. She says, I have to go into church for choir practice. Thank you so much for all you do, Carol. I will listen to it the rest tomorrow. I completely understand. I'm right there with you on schedules. I know how they can be. And thank you for joining me, Melissa. The original Great Wagon Road in Virginia traveled along the ridge lines, and they headed south and west to north and east. It always traveled in these directions, and it never changed to a direct east to west direction. Never, ever. It never did. When you mention the ridge lines, the further you get into Virginia on how this trail um, changed into the Great Wagon Road, the road had to be changed once it became a road. Some of these ridge lines were so steep, there was no way that a wagon was going to get up and over, up and over, and then crossing some of these um, creek crossings and streams and heavy rivers. Um, so, a lot of places the trail was alternated because of that, especially through Virginia. Um, the original road crossed the property of Robert Brook. This is the same guy that I had mentioned earlier. He is a surveyor, and his property linked at Falling Water. An east to west road did exist in this time period in Virginia, and that's the three notched road. And I want to get more into detail on that because it is important to the Great Wagon Road. The families that arrived in 1731 petitioned for the road in 1737 to connect to the Tidewater area. And why did they do this? Because of trade, because of the market capabilities and opportunities that were available to them. As these families settled, they create communities and then these families create new paths. They create new roads. The lower and upper Opequan settlements, Mill Creek and Hopewell, they all created roads once they got there. John Smith's Mill was surveyed by Robert Brooke in 1734, and it lied right on the Great Wagon Road. Um, the community of Mill Run was created. The only route that crossed the Blue Ridge at that particular time in 1730 was the Great Wagon Road. Hopewell, by 1737, had 12 smaller roads, small little paths that traveled mainly between neighbors, connecting each of them together. Other paths were called Heights Road, uh, Chester's Path, which ended at the Shenandoah River. And then there was also a little path that linked to Thomas Chester's Settlement. How many of you have heard of it? A mill constructed near the Potomac River was operated by Morgan Bryan in 1734. His business partner, Alexander Ross, owned property in Virginia right on the original Great Wagon Road. This is the same road that links to Quaker John Littler that I mentioned earlier. It's the same road that mentioned that I, that uh, connects John Smith's mill. Okay, And then it also travels right by the Hopewell Meeting House all during the 1730 decade. The three major players would land in Virginia or hoist height, the Van Meter brothers, Alexander Ross with his partner, Morgan Bryan. Others are Robert McKay, uh, William Russell, and Jacob Stover. Had a person to ask me earlier today if um, there were any books on Jacob Stover. 
and you know he was a very interesting person to research very he he tried to change his world uh during that time period if you've not heard of him i urge each of you to research farther into him but this person was asking if there was a book um dedicated to him to my knowledge there's not but there are many many books that do mention him um but he was a very interesting individual that migrated in, along the great wagon road and um uh, ended up in the shenandoah valley created a new settlement now I'm going to go back to the road that existed during that 1730 decade that came up from the Tidewater area, and that's called the Three-Notched Road. This road ran east to west from Richmond to the Shenandoah Valley. Many people seem to get this road confused or, or mixed up with the Great Wagon Road as the years grow go on. Um, by 1750, you have so many roads and paths and different routes routes to take in Virginia. It, it can be confusing, but don't let it. Just follow. The further you go back, you will see, when, and especially through these maps that I mentioned to you this evening, you will see just what I see. And you will see how these roads all of a sudden grew and they linked to other roads and how they grew into other roads and so on and so on. It's just like a jigsaw puzzle. So be aware of the three-notched road if you're early, if you're researching in this time period. It does run east to west. Other names for this route, and you will see this on surveys uh, dating from this time period in the 1730 decade, is Mountain Road, Mountain Ridge Road, or Three Chopped Road. It traveled from Augusta to Henrico County. Okay, a little bit of a distance. We're kind of crisscrossing across the state there. This would have been an alternate route for migrating families heading to the Trader's Path, which also led into North Carolina. So at the end of the 1730 decade, you've got this other route, Three Notched Road or Mountain Road or Mountain Ridge Road, and it connected at the base of the Shenandoah Valley. It kind of crisscrossed over traveling east. Now, a lot of people would have taken this because there's already an existing road that was in a little bit more better shape. It was called the Trader's Path. And it, it um, embarked from Petersburg, Virginia, in that area. And it had been in existence for years, which I'm going to get into. That would have been an alternate migration route that many of our families could have used. And there's various reasons why they would have traveled little bit east to get to that route it was more well maintained especially during after 1750 into the 1770 decade it was a much more well maintained versus the great wagon road so it would have been if it was a rainy season having a lot of rain or um then that would have been the number one reason if it was raining a lot because the Great Wagon Road was just, it was terrible through rainstorms. Uh, people would have to wait days to let it dry out before they could travel forward uh, because the Great Wagon Road wasn't that well maintained. So, and the Trader's Path was. So that would have been another migration route to look into. Peter Jefferson um, became the surveyor of the road, the three-notched road, he became surveyor of that road in 1734, okay, 1734. If you are researching your family's migrations, keep in mind this one important fact. I have stated many times, many, many, many times that the Moravians got lost traveling back and forth between North Carolina and Pennsylvania, and they admit this all throughout their personal diaries and journals. Did, they, did this occur because the road was hard to follow? The answer is yes, but it's not like you think, just like I just had stated. It was because there were too many paths to choose from. There were too many side routes to choose from, too many shortcuts to choose from. And it was easy to get confused on which one to take, especially after 1750. Because by that time period, you have so many people traveling and there's so many shortcuts so many different directions these paths are taking. It was it was easy. There's not signs. There don't have a great big bill for 
you know, billboard hang up. Okay, you take exit 1A right to your right <laughs> to your destination. They didn't have GPS. Um, it was very confusing. And, and you can understand how the Moravians, as much as they had traveled back and forth, especially after 1753, they went back and forth a lot. Um and you can understand how that would have happened until they became the same people became more familiar with it was taking the trip more than once. But yeah, they, they admit that they got lost and it was a reason why it was because it was a lot of paths to choose from. The great wagon road was a footpath at set in sections along black water Creek or black water river, um, horse pasture Creek, crooked Creek. These are all, waterways in southern virginia present-day southern virginia in 1730 decade the great wagon road was not a road in this area it was a footpath but that doesn't mean that there were no travelers there were here you will discover the trading routes and huge trains of pack horses they were delivering items for trade to the native tribes in north carolina and in south carolina and sections of georgia tennessee and Kentucky. Another thing I want to mention tonight before I forget it, in Salem, Virginia, and present-day Roanoke, there was also other footpaths that led from what that was called the Big Lick. That was Roanoke during this time period, 1730 decade, and there were footpaths that led to Kentucky and to eastern sections of Tennessee, to, and also to the Ohio River Valley. There were, and there were people that used them. They were just not equipped to use by, with wagons or wheeled carts, but they could travel them by walking or on horseback. In the Piedmont and western sections of North Carolina, many native trails thrived throughout the 1730 decade. One of these is the original Warrior's Path, okay? And then the Trader's Path connected the main large villages. By 1750, other roads and paths are linked to the Great Wagon Road and the Trader's Path. But in 1730, a road for wheeled wagons and carts existed in North Carolina by way of Thick Pins Trace. And this road traveled to Georgia during the Queen Anne's War. Now, I mentioned this before. Um, Barbara's here. Hello, Carol. Sorry I'm late. Hi, Bar Hi Barbara. I'm glad you joined us. I am tongue-tied tonight. I cannot speak correctly at all. Um, I have mentioned Thick Pins Trace before. So I don't know how to better explain it to you guys, but during Queen Anne's War, a military route was um, established in 1704, Thick Pins Trace. And it existed on into the 1730 decade, all throughout 1710, 1720s. It was used as a trading route. By 1730, it's a major trading route. Now it has changed names. It's no longer referred to as Thick Pins Trace or a military route for Queen Anne's War. It's now called the Trader's Path. Okay. And this Trader's Path was a wagon road during 1730. In North Carolina. Okay. All right. The Catawba Path, the Kiwi Trail, and many others uh, dominated with pack horses and merchandise traded for fur. They were also located in North Carolina. The Warriors Path continues to Georgia and is used as a main route in the 1740s. I'm going to share a hint with everyone tonight. Um, we've got, we've, just recently discovered some new things about the Catawba Path that um, link it to present-day Roanoke area in the Salem area, Roanoke and Salem area, and that it traveled a little bit west of, um, like it was going towards East Tennessee, and then it takes a drop down and goes through a gap. Um, a little mountain gap there at the edge of Carroll County, Virginia. We've been researching Flower Gap through there for um, many, many years. And a lot of um, early traveling ministers, they kept a lot of journals that traveled in this area. And um, Catawba Path definitely traveled that area too. And it went that way. However, 
when you get to where Pilot Mountain is and where um, Ararat River, I was trying to think of the other one, um, Fisher River, where they connect, there another path bared off to the right. And we know this because of our dear Moravians who did keep explicit records. They kept uh, documentation of where that path actually, that trail was when they first arrived in 1752. Okay, I am now going to share some maps with you guys. Um, I didn't have time to type all this out for you, so I'm going to read it out to you. You can find every one of these maps online. The first one is P.L. Phillips' List of Maps in Maryland. Um, this dates either 1770 or 1771, and it shows the Lancaster Road, okay? It shows the Lancaster Road. Now, Lancaster Road was actually paved with stone from Philadelphia down to Lancaster by 1795. It was a well, well-maintenanced road at, during that time period. Another map is Captain Snow's sketch. That is Captain Snow's sketch, dated 1754. It shows the road to Philadelphia from Maryland, all the way from Maryland going into Philadelphia. John Valance, V-A-L-L-A-N-C. John Valance, his map dates 1795 from Maryland, and there are many new roads on this map in 1795, but if you begin at Sharpsburg on Valence's map and then follow the road that um, travels northwest of Antietam Creek and goes up to the state line into Pennsylvania, you will be fairly close to the original 1730 route. Okay. John Armstrong, um, his map dating 1752-53 is of Pennsylvania, and it shows roads and paths that were available west of the Susquehanna River. The Jefferson Fry map of 1751 of Virginia, I don't, that's a great source to use. I need to explain a little something about that map. Um, Peter Jefferson, which was a great surveyor, um, the North Carolina portion of this map, Jefferson's books, his uh, travel notes, his journal, all of these things were left to his son, Thomas Jefferson, who later became the third president of the United States. And um, Peter, his father, passed away, I think, when at the age of 49. Um, it was a sudden, it wasn't an expected death. It was, it was sudden. And... So Thomas Jefferson had all of his books, his travel diaries, his journals, his notes, everything. And he, Peter Jefferson, conducted a lot of surveys. But the most famous survey that he did was a 1751 um, survey for Virginia and parts of North Carolina. And it clearly showed the Great Wagon Road traveling through Virginia. And I love the map. But I would love to see Peter Jefferson's notes. And because I I have a theory on the North Carolina section, I, I don't have find where Peter Jefferson or Joshua Fry ever traveled to North Carolina. So I go through Churton's, which is a, one of Granville's uh, main surveyors in North Carolina, to see if Churton may have corresponded with Peter's. Uh, Peter Jefferson and I, I don't really know but that could be a possibility but we don't have Peter Jefferson's notes to to know a, more information about the Great Wagon Road because I feel like if we would had his notes today that we would know a whole lot more about the Great Wagon Road but they were burned uh, in a fire and um, Thomas Jefferson was devastated to have lost his father's things um, I think the only thing that was few items were saved, a violin and some personal effects, but all of his uh, father's notes and everything were destroyed. Um, so that's such a great loss. It really is for the Great Wagon Road. It really is a great loss. Um, a clue was recently discovered printed by John Dunlap in the Pennsylvania Packet. How many of you have ever researched and gone through the advertisements that were published in the 
Pennsylvania packet. <laughs> They're fun to go through. But this particular one was dated uh, March 20th of 1778. And the advertisement offered a uh, reward for a stolen horse. And it also offered a clue about the Great Wagon Road. Lieutenant James Mackey, he left his horse in the care of Lieutenant Peter Cobb. And they were both members of the 11th Pennsylvania Regiment in 1778. Well, after he, McKay, uh, or Mackey, returned, Cobb told him that his horse was stolen. And it was stolen at the sign of the wagon on the Great Road leading from Philadelphia to Lancaster. What? <laughs> yeah. He, they, it is reported that the horse was stolen at the sign, S-I-G-N, -E at the sign of the wagon on the Great Road leading from Philadelphia to Lancaster. This must have been a very well-known sign, like a big billboard. Um, if you know anything about this sign, I want to know more because I, I just ran across this and I, I've never heard of that before. So if you have more information about the sign and its location, let me know. Because there wasn't any other clues in that advertisement. Um, just the reward and how much it was and what the horse looked like. It was a chestnut mare. Um, but I would be, I'm more interested in the sign of the wagon on the road. Another map is Mosley's map of 1733 for North Carolina. This map shows the Trader's Path, which is originally Thigpen's Trace, which dates to 1704. The Great Wagon Road joins the Trader's Path at Salisbury, North Carolina. Thomas Jeffrey's map, dating 1757, South Carolina, shows the roads for that time period, and it includes the western sections of Georgia. It's a very good map. And that's Thomas Jeffrey's map, 1757. It does show, a, and it shows great detail about uh, Georgia. Surnames traveling the Great Wagon Road during the 1730 decade. I couldn't go without mentioning this, uh, just a few surnames. So I'm just going to mention a few. Um, Cartmel, Beckett, B-E-C-K-E-T-T, -T, Glass, Heggy, Wood, Koval, Weiserman, Mark, M-A-U-K, Allen, James, Wilson, and Reed, and many, many more. This is just a small little group that I put together just a few minutes before I went on went live. Another great map is William Hammerton map of 1721, and that is H-A-M-M-E-R-T-O-N, 1721 shows the available roads in North Carolina and South Carolina, including all the lands to the Mississippi River. Okay, I'll repeat that. All the lands going to the Mississippi River. This is an invaluable map, and you can find it online. Every early inland settlement had a road leading to it, no matter where it was, and you. this is proof of it. And this map of uh, William Hamilton's map, it goes into detail about North Carolina, too, very much. All right. I, that is the end. That is the end. So how many of you had folk, uh, family that traveled during the 1730 decade? How do you think they traveled? So they did pretty good until they got to cross the Potomac into... Shenandoah Valley, but once Hoist Height got there and the Bordens and, you know, Borden Manor and they started developing these settlements, then they became, um, the roads grew naturally. Um, the Irish settlement that uh, was a little bit further south of the Shenandoah Valley, now they had a hard time. Once they reached Hopewell and they got through Hopewell, um, then the road is just very treacherous, and there, no wagon was going to go down it. Um, wagons didn't actually go to the southern portion of Virginia, entering into North Carolina till about the end of the 1740 decade, mid 1740s, um, latter part of 1740 decade. So we're talking a whole 10 years 
it so it did take a little while but that is a treacherous terrain too scotty says my oldest date is 1759 along the road so far i have um ancestors of the first one that comes to mind is 1765 and they definitely traveled the great wagon road and um they settled in the Piedmont section of North Carolina. Um, you can pinpoint the roads in which they traveled if you know the time period in which they traveled. Now, like I said, after 1750, it does become a little confusing because of all the roads that are available. But just concentrate on one section at a time. Look at all the uh, businesses and establishments that were there, taverns, ordinaries, inns, any place that could be likely that your family may have stopped along the way. And um, look at church records, too. A lot of times uh, visitors who were visiting a church, a local church, would be noted. So pay attention to church records. They, they may have a, and ferry re records also. On the Potomac River, they didn't necessarily need a ferry. Pack Horse 4 was very navigatable for any wagon to cross. You could walk across it as long as it wasn't heavy rains or flooding going on at the time. But um, entrepreneurs along the Potomac saw a money potential there. And so ferries were going up everywhere. And ferries were a good business. Um, they made good money. Um, most of them were set at certain rates, but, uh, if you were able to establish a ferry across a major water crossing, you had a reliable source of income and they do have records. You just need to look and see, how, you know, if, it, if there's records pertaining to your family. Brian says, I like this time period from 1730s to French and Indian war. I do too. It's one of my favorites because, um, there's several reasons. I, I like that period because it seems like it's like a brand new period. You can see the change coming um, as you go forward, after, especially after French and Indian War. And then we're going into uh, more a political aspect and what's going on in these communities. And then we've got things going on with higher taxes and all this other stuff. Um, and then the American Revolutionary War. So you can see the change in, coming. But I like the 1730 decade. It's like it's um, more of a calm period. Um, the Native uh, Americans are trying to work with the Europeans who are arriving. And they seem to be, now not in every case, but especially in Virginia with Spotswood and his um, active, what his role and how he played that with Okanichi Fort, um, the Okanichi tribes. And South Carolina does a great job, too, in um, creating nego negotiations with the Cherokee and, and keeping peace. But it just seems like a quiet decade. It's not till later, um, like during the French and Indian War and, and those years later, that things become totally different. But I like this decade. One of my deeds indicates, uh, Scotty says, one of my deeds indicates the property is near the road. Oh, that's fantastic. I would be looking all into that. <laughs> Land records are your, some of your best resources. They are proof. And what I told a friend the other day, this is a legal, lawful uh, documentation that proves without a shadow of a doubt that this particular person lived here and this is where they live near Great Wagon Road, Land, whatever that road would be. Um, but they are proof, legal document, um, document proof. It's the 1790 time period. That's great. And as you, um, there's a time, there's a little low. I'll tell this to people too. There's a lull with land grants that they get kind of, uh, slack on their des descriptions with surveys. And, um, they, especially, um, during the American Revolutionary War years, there's just it just seems like everything just goes apart with land records. But afterwards, then they really get a little bit more detailed into it. And they tell you which border, how they border on this property. And, they, and it's much more detailed. Um, I like land records to have a lot of detail because you run into less mistakes that way. Okay, you guys. 
I am going to leave it at that. I want to thank you so much for joining me. If you would like to learn more about the Great Wagon Road Project and what we do, just visit us at PiedmontTrails.com and join the journey with us. Uh, if you suspect that you have a an old colonial road bed on your property or you know where one is at and you're not sure how what it is and you would like to let us know about it, let us know. You can do that by hitting um, emailing us at contact at PiedmontTrails.com or you can go to the website and just click on the contact tab and you can just get in touch right with me right then and there. Um, there's always something new to learn um, no matter which decade that you research in. And it's fascinating. And I think that the more that we share it with one another, then we preserve it that way at the same time. And I think that's just great. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, y'all, for your kind words. I greatly appreciate them. I hope that each and every one of you had a happy, happy Thanksgiving. Our next live stream will not be until January. The last Sunday in December is on Christmas. So we won't have one, a live stream for the month of December back in January in 2023. So until then, I every one of you a Merry, Merry Christmas. And thank you so much for joining me this evening. And I wish you great success with your journey to the past. And may God bless.